The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. As Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat with their father and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the one God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So if you've been with us, in person or online over the last five weeks, you have heard in sermons and interviews how it indeed can be well with our souls. We've we've, uh, looked at the world around us and looked into our own hearts and, and wondered, do I have worth? Where's my community? Am I on my own? Will the kids be all right? And do I have purpose? I I am tremendously grateful for those of you, for the parishioners who've shared their stories of finding God's peace through the life of this church and to Christina Santiago Turner for her wonderful interviews too. So if you have found some peace, whether through those sermons and interviews or just through a great Thanksgiving weekend with people you love, now what? I mean, how do you hang on to God's peace? Well, I think actually the truth is, you don't. In fact, you can't, I don't think. It's a a counterintuitive truth. And we can see it if we stand alongside our patron, good old St. Andrew. Now, I was blessed to be able to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land in May, um, and so I, I am fortunate to be able to see today's story of Andrew's call with kind of fresh eyes. I mean, I don't know what comes to your mind when you hear about the disciples fishing out on the Sea of Galilee, you know, what image comes to you, but it's actually not a sea at all. It's it's just a lake. I mean, it's a nice lake, but, but it's just a lake and not one big enough that you might actually mistake it for a sea. I mean, you can see the opposite shore from from standing on the beach. The whole sea is 13 miles long and eight eight miles wide at, at its widest point. But it was an economic engine for the people of Galilee back in the day. I mean, people like Andrew and Peter and their father Zebedee, commercial fishermen who, <clears throat> who spent much of their life out on that lake. Well, when we picture Andrew and Peter and Zebedee and the other guys, we, we may miss the amazing geographical variety that they would have seen in their tiny land. To take, a, take a look at the, the pictures in the bulletin or just enjoy the, the images as they come up um, on the screen if you're at home. Um, it, it, it's an amazing variety within the space of about 120 miles. The, the distance from Kansas City to Columbia or Kansas City to just past Manhattan, if you prefer that comparison. Um, <clears throat> but in, in the distance of just those 120 miles, the, the waters of this land change drastically. So at the very northeastern corner of Israel, up at the top of the map there, is a spring that starts the Banyas River, one, one of three sources of the Jordan River. And this headwater of, of the Jordan really is chilly and cold, as the old spiritual says, because it flows fast and freely through a nature preserve, actually, a beautiful green space, sort of the opposite of what you might expect to see in, in Israel, um, you know, full of dust and rocks in most of the pictures we see. But the Jordan runs about 25 miles south from there until it creates the Sea of Galilee that place where Jesus and his friends spent so much time. And even now, when you you go there, you see fishing boats out on the lake along with the pilgrims and the tourists. 
we stayed at Magdala on the, on the lake shore, and I got up early a, a couple of mornings just to watch the sun rise over the Golan Heights. It was gorgeous. Birds gliding over the water, looking for breakfast, you know. The water lapping at the lake's edge, as it has for thousands of years. And maybe inviting you to do a little time traveling of your own as you stand there. The, the, the Sea of Galilee has supported all manner of life there since waters began flowing from those springs up north. Now, fishermen like Andrew and Peter and Zebedee would have had a challenging time, certainly. But, but even if they didn't catch much on a given day, you know, they could trust the fish were going to be there tomorrow. It was that plenteous. So from our hotel there <clears throat> at the north end of the Sea of Galilee, we drove south. And before long, as you go down the lake shore, the east and the west sides of the lake come together as the lake changes back into the Jordan River that began it. That river creates the boundary between the West Bank and the nation of Jordan, as well as irrigating thirsty dust into an agricultural gem, I'm kind of like California's Central Valley. And because of the irrigation, the, the river is much smaller today than it would have been when you know, Jesus and Andrew and everybody was, was, was there at the water's edge. But there is still plenty of water for pilgrims to wade in at the side of Jesus' baptism. It, it may be muddy, as the picture shows, but it is life-giving, both now and eternally. And then about nine miles south from that place where John the Baptist brought the crowds into the water of life, the water changes drastically. Because at that point, it begins the Dead Sea, the lowest point on earth, and a site that certainly deserves its name. <laughs> the only... The only living creatures in this water are the folks who come to float on its super buoyancy and smear mineral-laden mud all over themselves. But across the road, <clears throat> from at least where we stopped, um, across the road are the ruins of the community of Qumran and the, and the caves where ancient scribes left what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls. But those folks living at Qumran certainly did not drink the water in the Dead Sea. Because captured there in the pit of the lowest place on earth, the Jordan River mixes with ancient minerals to just lie there flat, still, and poisonous, actually, evaporating in the blazing sun to create one of the earth's most desolate landscapes. Okay, so why, why am I telling you all this? Because, I think, at least, it is one of God's very best metaphors. Uh, a geographic parable about the life into which Jesus invited Andrew and invites us still. Now, about this metaphor, I, I need to acknowledge that I have stolen this <clears throat> from, from countless other writers and preachers, including our presiding bishop. But, but, you know, in the spirit of imitation being the sincerest form of flattery, we'll, we'll go on. Um, because the message matters. I, I think it is God's own truth about the Christian life and about our search for peace in a world gone mad. So maybe you have known moments when, when you've been blessed to dwell in peace and joy. You know, times when life feels abundant, like the headwaters of the Jordan at Banyas. You, you drink in blessing as you watch God's abundance flow to you. And it gathers around you like a lake, you know, like the Sea of Galilee. You, you fish from it and swim in it and stand by the water's edge, letting life's soft waves lap at your toes. You know, the... This lake of blessing could feed you forever, body and soul. I mean, those times of abundance are the times of heaven on earth. And there is maybe a surprising reason why it works that way, both in the lake and in the metaphor. That the Sea of Galilee is a desert oasis because the water of life flows through it. 
Every day, millions of gallons flow into the lake from the cool springs up north. And every day, millions of gallons flow out of the lake as, as the Jordan River runs south, watering that fertile valley as, as well as welcoming pilgrims to die and rise with Christ in baptism. But the Sea of Galilee is a source of life because God's life-giving water flows through it. It's constantly renewed and refreshed with water from above because it constantly gives its life away downstream. So there's your model, God says. <laughs> Let my abundance of blessing flow to you and through you, God says. That abundance will keep coming, renewing your life always if you pass it on. I mean, if, if we heard nothing else from the sermons and interviews over the past five weeks, we have heard this, that, that your friends here at St. Andrews are finding God's peace precisely by letting God's love flow through them to bless the people around them. Now, the other model in the metaphor, of course, lies at the river's end. I mean, the Dead Sea is just that, dead. And, and, and it is that way because it has no outlet. I mean, the, the water of life flows in, but the lowest spot on earth grabs hold of it and clings to divine blessing with a zero-sum mindset. It, it acts the way we act when, when we're faced with our own fear of scarcity. You know, if I, share, <clears throat> if I share what God gives me, there won't be enough left for me, right? But God says, no, no, my love turns your fears upside down. I mean, Christianity is a religion of paradox, that's for sure. And, and one of our greatest paradoxes is this, that the more you give love the more you get love. The more God's peace flows through you, the more peace you know yourself. God's love only lives when it's shared. And maybe that counterintuitive truth is what flowed through Andrew's heart when he took that crazy step to leave his boat and his father and his livelihood and and, and trust that even more abundant love was on its way. I, I kind of think Andrew had learned the lesson of the Sea of Galilee. And now he knew he had to share himself with a world that had taught him to be afraid and to clench God's blessings before somebody else could take him away. <laughs> and the lesson came maybe to its greatest expression then later in the feeding of the 5,000 as Andrew provides the five loaves and the two fish and says, what is this among so many? But they find that there is plenty. When we take what God gives us and ask God to bless it and break it faithfully and share it with all who come to the banquet table. So today, as you know, we're, we're gathering our pledges of estimated giving to our church family for next year. And, and in just a few minutes, we will stand at this altar and, and bless the pledges that we've received so far. If you haven't made your pledge for God's work here in the next year, you can find pledge booklets actually at the ends of the pews closest to the aisle. Or you can pledge in minutes through the church website. It's very easy. But let me say this directly. Your giving doesn't just bless the church, though it certainly does. Even more, it blesses you. I mean, your soul needs for you to give. You sleep better when you give. You, you cope with loss better when you give. You deal with annoying people better when you give. And, and here's why. Is it's by giving that God's love flows through you. And it's only when God's love flows through you that you know God's peace. I mean, that doesn't really make sense according to the rules of the world, which is probably why the Apostle Paul called it the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. 
So as you consider what you'll give back next year from the abundance that God's given you, remember Andrew looking across over the Sea of Galilee. Remember the clear, cool water flowing into the lake from the northern Jordan River. Remember that lake teeming with life and supporting thousands living around it. Remember the Jordan flowing freely again to the south, watering dry ground to make it a regional breadbasket. I mean, just as life-giving water flows through that arid land, so does God's love flow to us and through us to water the dry places of our world. <laughs> and if we don't, I mean, if we, if we grasp and cling to that love that God gives us so freely, if, if, if we dole out God's blessing in drips and drabs, thinking we can keep most of that living water for ourselves, that's when we find ourselves living on the shore of the Dead Sea. It just is. I think Andrew would ask us to choose differently. In fact, I think he'd ask us to see our lives as God's life in microcosm. You know, given the chance to stay put, move forward. Given the chance to hang on to what we think is ours, let go. Given the chance to store up resources in fear, give them away. Let God's waters of blessing flow through you. And your Lord and your world and your own soul will thank you for it.